Welcome to the Northbound Wealth Podcast. All opinions expressed by me, my co-hosts, or my guests are solely our own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Northbound Wealth Management, LLC. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be relied upon for any investment, tax, or legal advice, or as a solicitation to offer or buy any securities. Investments include the risk of loss and past performance is not indicative of future returns. Clients of Northbound Wealth Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hey everybody, this is Brent Foster, founder and CEO of Northbound Wealth Management, and this is the 32nd week of the Northbound Wealth Weekly Market Insights podcast. Today is February 27, 2023, and I'm really excited to head into this week's podcast and market review of last week. So here's the headline, FOMC says inflation is still too high. For those of you who don't know who the Federal Open Market Committee is, well, it's kind of difficult to miss. Jay Powell or Jerome Powell uh, is the head of the Fed in the United States. And you'll see a, a multitude of press conferences from a bunch of Fed heads that talk about uh, all kinds of things uh, economic. Concerns over a firmer monetary policy were heightened by fresh economic data touching off a climb in bond yields and a slide in stock prices last week. The Dow Jones Industrial Average skidded 2.99%, while the S&P 500 dipped 2.67%. The NASDAQ Composite Index sagged 3.33% for the week. The MSCI EFA Index, which tracks developed overseas stock markets, retreated 1.23%. So what does that mean for the Dow? The Dow closed at 32,816 and change. Year to date, that's down 1%. So we've had a sell-off in the Dow. NASDAQ closed at 11,394 and change. Year to date, that's up 8.87%. So tech is doing the best this year so far out of the major indices. Uh, You got MSCI EFA index closed at 2061. Uh, That's up 6.05% for the week. And the S&P 500 closed at 3,970. That's up 3.4% for the year. 10-year treasury note closed at 3.95% year to date. That's up 0.07%. So uh, keep an eye on the 10-year treasury as it approaches 4%. Uh, 4% uh, usually that means the stock market's going to slide even more. So stocks struggled last week, uh, buffeted by growing fears of further Fed tightening and disappointing forecasts from two major retailers that called into question the consumer's health. The release of the minutes from the FOMC last meeting did little to assuage investor worries. Reflecting these concerns of a more aggressive Fed was that by Thursday, traders were pricing in a 27% chance that the Fed might lift rates by half a percentage point at its next meeting, or 50 basis points, far above the 1.3% chance just one month ago. So stocks took another leg lower on Friday following the release of January's Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, or the PCE, which uh, showed hotter than expected price increases and more robust consumer spending. Huh, interesting when there's a lot of cash in the system. FOMC minutes. So the minutes from the meeting indicated that nearly all the members agreed With February's quarter point rate increase, though some would have supported a 50 basis point hike to move quicker towards the Fed's target range. While the minutes suggested another 25 basis points hike is likely at their next meeting, investors remain anxious and uh, that more recent economic data may prompt a 50 basis point hike instead. And we saw that kind of uh, leak out as uh, Jay Powell uh, uh, has, has been talking to people. And people speculate into that, that uh, there'll be 50 basis points. The minutes stressed inflation was still too high. No kidding. However, minutes diverged on the economy with some members finding the risk of recession elevated. In contrast, others feel the Fed may engineer a soft landing or avoid a recession altogether. This whole thing about a soft landing and engineering, um, I just find fascinating. 
engineering a soft landing. Wow. So uh, let's see. Last year, uh, the NASDAQ was down 33%. S&P was down over 22%. And bonds were down the worst year they've ever had. Hmm. It, soft landing, right? Uh, I, it's just comical. I, all this jargon and language that's being tossed around and has been for so long, it gets exhausting. Um, but let's see here this week's key economic data. Monday, durable goods orders. Tuesday, consumer confidence. Wednesday, Institute for Supply Chain Manufacturing Index or ISM surveys. Uh, Thursday, jobless claims. Friday, Institute for Supply Chain Management or ISM services index. So, you know, real fascinating, boring stuff. Uh, let's see, notable companies reporting earnings. Monday, Workday. Tuesday, Occidental Petroleum Corporation. Target, AutoZone, Ross Stores. Wednesday, Salesforce, Lowe's, Dollar Tree. Thursday, Broadcom, Costco, Best Buy, Marvell, Dell Technologies. So out of Thursdays, I'm really curious about Costco. Really uh, I think that will their data is going to show us quite a bit about the consumer and its durability. This week's tax tip, you have the right to retain representation when working with the IRS, but you have the right to retain an authorized representative to represent you when dealing with the IRS. If you can't afford representation, seek help from a low income taxpayer clinic or LITC, if you didn't know those existed, which I didn't. An authorized representative can represent you in interviews, audits, appeals, and, and tax collection disputes with the IRS and in court. Authorized representatives include attorneys, CPAs, enrolled agents, enrolled actuaries, or any other person who has submitted a written power of attorney to represent you. Well, that's interesting. This information is not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized tax advice. We suggest that you discuss your specific tax issues with a qualified tax professional. And this tip was adapted from the irs.gov. Here's a piece that I like. It's the executive summary of JP Morgan's long-term capital market assumptions, uh, which I happen to examine and agree with. Uh, it's in line with uh, actually uh, what a lot of the larger asset managers out there are saying, Vanguard, BlackRock, and stuff like that. So uh, it's not just isolated to uh, JP Morgan at all, but Vanguard says some of the same stuff. Um, and since I used to work at JP Morgan, I thought I'd uh, give them a shout out for writing this up. I, I do like it. And uh, they have one of the best research departments out there, which I've uh, appreciated uh, having access to, and it allows me to do a lot of analytics and helps uh, helps me manage portfolios. So here we go. I thought I'd uh, share this with all of my audience. The market drawdown in 2022 is creating an, an increasingly attractive entry point for long-term investors, and I don't disagree with that. Just uh, caution is warranted, though. Um, given where the market's trading now, I think it's still the valuations are too high. They need to come down a little bit more. So um, let's see, back to basics. Lower valuations and higher yields mean that asset markets today offer the best long-term returns in more than a decade. It took a painful slump in stock and bond markets to get here, and the worst may not yet be over. So as an aside, um, we see there, there are opportunities out there and there, there's probably going to be even more. So whenever, whenever markets come down, like they did last year, um, big firms are always going to say, Hey, this is a great time to be buying. And, and it, it, they're actually right about that. When, when the markets do come down 20 to 30% or the bond markets down, you know, the worst it ever was like 12 last year, then it, then it is a good time to be shopping and looking and, um, with, with new money or cash or, or investing through that time, because, uh, those returns, uh, that are projected out 10, 15 years from now are going to be most likely better. Um, most likely, but we don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, but, um, let's get back to this article, but after a year of turmoil, the core principles of investing still hold firm. Once again, 60, 40 or 60% 60 stocks and 40% bonds can 
uh, form the bedrock of portfolios while alternatives can offer alpha, inflation protection, and diversification. Meanwhile, the end of free money or greater two-way risk and inflation and policy and increased return dispersion across assets also give active managers more to swing for. Um, in the near term, investor in the near term, investors face a challenging time as a recession or at least several quarters of subtrend growth lie immediately ahead. Still, our assessment of long-term trend growth is only marginally below last year's. We expect today's inflationary surge to eventually subside to a rate only slightly above our previous estimates. Bonds normalize and stock forecasts soar. Our forecast annual return for a USD, which is dollar denominated 60 40 stock bond portfolio over the next 10 to 15 years, leaps from 4.3% last year to 7.2% this year. So um, that's an annualized rate of return that they're talking about. So on a go forward basis, what is a 60-40 stock bond portfolio expected to do over the next 10 to 15 years? Instead of 4.3% annualized going forward, it jumps up to 7.20% annualized going forward. After policy rates normalize swiftly, bonds no longer look like serial losers. Once again, they offer a plausible source of income as well as diversification. Higher riskless rates also translate to improved credit return forecasts. Projected equity returns rise sharply. In local currency terms, our developed market equity forecast rises 340 basis points to 7.80%, and in emerging markets, jumps 230 basis points to 8.90%. Corporate profit margins will likely recede from today's levels, but not revert completely to their long-term average. Stock and bond valuations present an attractive entry point. Alternatives still offer benefits like diversification or risk reduction, correlation, non-correlation, not easily found elsewhere uh, with the U.S. dollar more overvalued than any time since the 1980s. The FX translation, FX means currency, will be a significant component to forecast returns. There's a lot going on with that the, that set of three paragraphs. Hopefully you guys can follow along there. If you have questions, be happy to talk to you about them. But scarce capital surging demand for CapEx or capital expenditures or capital spending by companies. So they're basically saying that scarce capital uh, liquidity is drying up and, and, and there's surging demand for capital expending. Uh, expenditures, uh, and investment. So many long-term themes affecting our outlook, demographic shifts, globalization. So many long-term themes affecting our outlook. There's, there are many. And uh, obviously, uh, this is a complicated market and economic season that we're in. Demographics shift in globalization patterns will demand higher capital investment. Paradoxically, just as the abundance of cheap capital of the last decade is reversing, as financial markets look to efficiently allocate scarce capital, the results may be more idiosyncratic returns and lower correlations within indices. So choose wisely if you're going to invest, right? You want to invest in those areas that are going to be getting the capital investment, not the areas that aren't. Overall, the return outlook this year. Uh, in this year's long-term capital market assumption stands in stark contrast to last year's. Headwinds from low yields and high valuations have dissipated or even reversed, and asset return forecasts might be considered, quote, back at par, end quote. Asset reset, attractive entry points. So what they're saying here is it's taken a meaningful reset in asset markets to bring us to this place and considerable pain for bondholders over a much shorter horizon than we had expected. Still, the underlying patterns of economic growth look stable and the assumptions that underpin asset returns, cycle, neutral real cash rates, curve shape, default and recovery rates, and margin expectations are little altered. 
But the market drawdown in 2022 is now creating an increasingly attractive entry point for long-term investors. I like how they keep saying that. While 2022 was a painful ride as long-standing dislocations closed sharply, investors can now look forward to compounding future returns at much more attractive levels. So they are basically trying to say now is the time to start allocating capital. But but I don't necessarily agree with that 100% because uh, I don't think they're being forthright in the exact timing of that. And it is important. Timing does matter and price does matter more. So price trumps time. And so where the markets are trading and the valuations that they're trading at may still be too high. So therefore it is too early, potentially put money to work. It means maybe there's some uh, levels in the stock market um, that are to the downside that we still have to get to before capital should be deployed. And especially when you have a three month T-bill or treasury note paying 4.8%, you have a six month, nine month, one year notes all paying above 5%. That's guaranteed money by the that, that's backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government that's going to pay you yield to maturity that's 5%. I mean, that's risk-free, basically. You know, that's not too far off of the 7 point, you know, 2 or 7.3% annualized rate of returns that they're expecting uh, in a 60-40 portfolio. That's a heck of a lot less risk. And and if you're going to go full into and buying 60% of a of a million bucks, like 600,000 of a million dollars into the stock market at this, at this point, that's a heck of a lot more risk to do, to be taking uh, when you could just park it for a while into treasuries and earn five. So, you know, long, short term, that might be a good idea. Long term, uh, probably not as inflation comes down and equities start to rip and maybe make more money. So, you know, we just, you just got to work with your financial advisor. If you work with Northbound Wealth Management, work with us on on what your specific investment strategy looks like and is. Here are some, these are just some thoughts about uh, JP Morgan's article on long-term capital market assumptions, looking at 2023 and beyond 10, 15 years out. So hopefully you guys gleaned a little bit from that and hopefully it was helpful. Hey, this is Brent Foster, Northbound Wealth Management. And I'm going to go over probably multiple weeks of of touching on a book that is foundational to me. It's called Managing God's Money by Randy Alcorn. And uh, if I break it out into segments, it'll be a good ongoing learning opportunity for everyone. But it starts in chapter 21, and it's entitled In the Family, Teaching Children How to Manage God's Money and Possessions. Aren't we all children? Yeah, we all are. And we're all on our own journey and everybody does it differently. So it's, I think it's good to kind of go over some foundational things and get some insights. Uh, Here we go. So everything learned in life from coping methods to table manners is learned in families. Families are the heart and soul of a society with the home, not the school is the primary place of learning. Home is where character is built, habits are developed, and destinies are forged. Proverbs tells us, quote, direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it, end quote. That's Proverbs 22, verse 6. Children imitate everything we do, whether important or unimportant, healthy or unhealthy. Sometimes our children will fail to listen to us. Rarely will they fail to imitate us. Moses told God's people, quote, you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk to them when you are at home and when you are on the road and when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to the hands or to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Deuteronomy 6, chapter 6, uh, 6 through 9. This great passage describes the training process as both formal and informal. We are constantly to teach our children God's word and talk about its principles on occasions that arise throughout the day. Often the informal discussions will open the door for a formal instruction and vice versa. 
Every experience your children have with money is a teaching opportunity. Some lessons they will learn the hard way. Children who lose or ruin their favorite possessions through carelessness will learn a valuable lesson. So will those who see the joy in another's eyes as a result of them giving something away. Often parents can help by verbalizing a lesson. We have no idea how deeply we affect our children by our casual offhand comments. One night, one of my daughters was seven years old. She prayed, Dear Lord, I thank you so much that we're not too rich and we're not too poor. This pleased me, but also surprised me. Where did it come from? As I thought about it, I remembered that probably six months earlier, I had shared briefly with her a verse in Proverbs. Quote, give me neither poverty nor riches. That's end quote, Proverbs 30, verse 8. I applied it to a situation we saw while driving somewhere. I had long since forgotten that conversation. Obviously, my daughter hadn't. The more children have witnessed wise stewardship practiced by their parents, the more natural it will seem to them. If parents give generously, save rather than borrow and spend carefully, they grant their children a wonderful gift and help protect them from financial disaster. Randy Alcorn goes on and asks the question, how can we help children connect money with work? So as parents, we should teach our children to associate money with labor. Money and possessions do not fall out of the sky. They are earned through diligence and effort. A common mistake that their parents make is to dole out money to children arbitrarily. This teaches them to believe money comes easily or automatically. They begin imagining it's their right to have money even when they haven't worked for it. And many carry this misconception into their adult lives. Although money should be associated with work, not all work should be associated with money. Children shouldn't always be paid for their chores. However, there are many extras that can legitimately be rewarded financially, and children can take on jobs outside the home as they grow older, including washing cars, mowing lawns, cleaning house, or babysitting. Teaching our children a productive work ethic is essential. It's equally important that children learn to correctly prioritize work and other commitments. Young people who are encouraged or allowed by their parents to put other pursuits above ministry, fellowship, and the teaching of scripture will live out those same principles as adults and as church members if they aren't too busy making money to go to church at all. And in the third section, in the final one of this particular segment, he Randy Alcorn uh, talks about or asks the question about how can we teach children to save? So children learn the value of money and the discipline of self-control through saving. They need reasons and incentives to save. If they want a major item, help them develop a plan to work for and save the money. If they stick to their plan to save over a long period of time, buying that item won't be an impulsive decision. Many parents know what it's like to have teenagers go to uh, costly school events. Kids may want to buy expensive dresses or rent tuxedos and go out to fancy restaurants. Parents who automatically pick up the tab for such events do their children a disservice. If teenagers believe that these events warrant that kind of money, they need to work for it themselves months in advance if necessary. When working for something is the only alternative, it's amazing how many creative options young people can come up with and still have a great time. We helped put our daughters through college just as our parents helped us. However, I don't believe that parents should automatically pay for their children's entire college education. When young people work to earn money for college, they develop character and financial responsibility. Some parents offer to pay for classes their children earn as A's and B's in, but the student has to pay for the classes in which he or she gets C or lower. Suddenly, they have motivation to study. So, um, the, so in next week, I'm going to pick up where I left off, and it'll be how uh, Randy Alcorn will address how can we help children become generous givers. And there's a few more sections after that that I'll cover in the coming weeks. But I just thought it would be good to refresh your memory from a guy who has written some uh, best-selling books on uh, personal finance with uh, biblical foundational principles that um, that are tried and true. And I think most people, even if even if they're non-believers or non-Christians, can can relate to that and understand um, these foundational principles apply across uh, faiths and religions and stuff like that. So. Um, anyway, food for thought. Hope you, hopefully you guys enjoyed that segment. Thank you for listening to the Northbound Wealth Management Weekly Market Insights with your host, Brent Foster, founder and CEO of Northbound Wealth Management. Until next week, have a great weekend. We'll talk to you soon.